<laughs> Let's turn in our Bible to John 15, if you will, please. <clears throat> John 15. We've already read verses 18 to 27. The first 17 verses, remember, as I said, is all about life in the vine, Jesus being that vine. And life in the vine amounts to a loving fellowship. In fact, in the first 17 verses, the word love or some form of it is mentioned nine times. The second half of this chapter that we're looking at this morning is about life in a hateful world. And you'll find some form of the word hate seven times in those verses that we're in this, uh, this morning. I guess you can say, this is what you can expect if you are abiding in Christ. I know there's glory. I know there is an abundant life. There is much fruitfulness. But you can't neglect this truth, this reality, that we live in a world that really hates Jesus. And I think we're seeing it in our country even more than we ever have before, more than I can ever remember. There is a passage in the Gospel of Mark that says that Jesus ordained 12 men, talking about the disciples. He ordained 12, listen, that they should be with him, and then that he would send them forth to preach. Our God is a sending God. He brings people to himself. He draws people close, and then he sends them out. And Jesus warned those that he sent out in Matthew 10 and verse 16, I am sending you as sheep among wolves. Listen to this. Sheep among wolves. The identity of of Jesus's followers is that they're like sheep. And the identity of the world that he is sending them out into is that the world is like wolves. You see, Jesus wants his followers to know that the environment that they are called to share the gospel in is a hostile one. If you are a follower that obeys Jesus, you have to come to the realization early on that persecution is not merely a possibility. It is a certainty that all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, without a doubt, suffer persecution. Who here that is a follower of the Lord Jesus has suffered persecution? If you are a genuine, faithful follower, you've suffered some form of it. We don't have very difficult persecution here in the United States of America, at least at this point. But most of the world does. Most of uh, the world that believers live in are in very severe times of persecution. So I want us to look at the description that we have here in verses 18 to 20, first of all, a description of the persecution. And then in the verses 21 to 25, what's behind it? What's driving it? What's the motivation for the world, these wolves coming upon the sheep, hating believers? And then the last uh, couple of verses, 26 and 27, what's God's solution? What's the solution to this persecution that we find ourselves in? That's what I want to share with you in the minutes that we have left. Let's pause a moment and pray. Father in heaven, so grateful that we can come together this morning. Thankful that we have your word, the Bible, and pray that you would make it very fitting and very practical to every single person here. You know the need of our lives. And so, Lord, speak accordingly. Get glory to the Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord, we pray that we lift you up. We thank you for the promises that we have. We thank you for the tokens of good that, that you give us, which just reveal that you hear us and that you are working in the behalf of your people. And so we're trusting you this morning. Spirit of God, we're trusting you to 
work in every single heart of the listener. Anoint the hearts. Anoint the listeners. <coughs> let, let them get what you have for them. Lord, I'm trusting you to enable me to make the message that you've given clear, powerful, and again, that it would not go forth void, but will accomplish your purpose, the thing that pleases you. Lord, if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that doesn't know you as personal Savior, may they come under conviction of sin and recognize that Jesus is the only solution, the only answer to that, and that they can have complete forgiveness if they will trust him, receive him, and depend upon what he did in their place when he became their substitute and took the punishment of their sin upon himself on that tree. And then, Lord, awaken those of us that know you. And may we be prepared for what's ahead, for the persecution that is going to be on the increase. Even if we have a, a time of reprieve, it's coming. And, Lord, uh, we've been living in a very unrealistic uh, period of time for many years in this nation where we have had relatively little or no persecution upon your people. But, oh, God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our understanding today. Again, all to your glory. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> so I want to look at the 18th to 20th verse and give, give you a little bit of a description of persecution. Look at it. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Boy, we see that every day in the media. We see that every day uh, on television, right? The world loves its own. No doubt about that. But because you're not of the world, I have chosen you, Jesus says, out of the world. Yes, physically we're in the world. But spiritually, we have been chosen out of this world. We are not a worldly people. This world really isn't our place of abode. He says, I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, as a result of that, the world hates you. Remember, verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, Jesus says, they'll persecute you. If they kept my saying, they'll keep your words also. Your saying also is what he's telling them. There are two main things in these verses that really are a description of the persecution that believers face. Two things that describe believers who are in the vine, if you will. And one of which is simply that if you are a believer, you are distinct. You're distinct from the world. Yes, you're in the world, but you are not of the world. You are distinct from the world because you in these verses are very clearly identified with Jesus. You are in oneness with Christ. One of the beautiful truths about being a believer is that you have been spirit, spiritually joined to Christ. Your human spirit and the spirit of Jesus are one. And that is exactly why the world hates you. I remember years ago when uh, uh, a man that uh, got saved was uh, praying for a long time for his wife to follow him and trust the Lord as her Savior. Finally, she got saved. They had had marital problems prior to that. And that baggage they carried into their saved relationship as well. And I remember him coming to me and uh, and complaining to me about their marriage, you know, and his wife's a new believer. He's been saved several years now. And uh, he told me what he how he had been treating her. And I remember that the Lord just impressed upon my heart to take him to Acts chapter nine. And in Acts chapter nine, you have the record of Saul of Tarsus being uh, struck down on that road to Damascus, where his life is changed. But when he's struck down by that bright light, by the Shekinah glory of God, really on that on that road, he falls down. He's blinded by that light, and uh, the the first thing he says is, "Who are you, Lord?" And the Lord answers him and says, "This I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting." Now, Saul of Tarsus 
had uh, authority from the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin to round up and arrest and prosecute any believer in Jesus, anyone that was a part of the way of the of the Nazarene, as it was called. And uh, that's what he was doing. He was good at it. And that's why he was headed to Syria and Damascus to do that very thing. Listen. Jesus said, you're not merely persecuting my people. When you arrest them and persecute them, you persecute me. This is God's description. This is the distinction of persecution. Whenever believers are persecuted, Jesus is being persecuted. He feels it. He likens our persecution to his persecution. He takes it personally. And uh, there is really, persecution is simply this. Simply put, it's a negative reaction on the part of unbelievers to the incarnation, the, the incarnate presence of Jesus in believers. Jesus doesn't walk this earth as he once did for 33 years uh, with a body like ours but rather he walks this earth in his people's bodies. We're his feet, we're his hands, we're his mouth, we're his eyes. And so persecution is simply the negative reaction of unbelievers to the incarnate presence of Jesus in you, if you're a believer. You choose to be a believer you also then choose to be Jesus-like. You, as a result, will share the same hatred that they had for him in the days of his flesh when he walked this earth like you and I do. Did you know that persecution is the norm globally? Listen to this. You may not have realized it. 80% of believers worldwide are living in persecution. 80%. That means we as Americans are just part of a mere 20% of believers that really aren't suffering much persecution at all. 80% of worldwide believers are living in it. And the only way to ever stop persecution is simply to disobey Jesus's call. Because when you witness You are identified with persecuted people. When you refuse to witness, you are identified with the persecutors that persecute believers. That's the decision that we have to make. So, first of all, those that are persecuted, they're distinct. And because they're distinct, number two, they're different. That's what verse 19 really tells us. You're different. You know the basis upon which the world functions? I think we all we may not have thought about this, but this is the basis upon which the world functions. The world functions on the basis of conformity. That is, you the key to survival in this world is that you go along to get along. That's the that's conformity. But the Christian doesn't go that way. Be not conformed to this world. And so as a result, we're going against the tide as believers. We don't merely go along to get along. As a believer, you have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, which is really another phrase for this world. Spiritually, you have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, and you have been put into God's kingdom, his spiritual kingdom. And so as a result, you're different. You're not only out of step with this world, but you are out of place in this world. This world is not your friend. As Newton says, this world is not a friend of grace to lead us home to God. This world is not our home. We're pilgrims. We're foreigners. We're aliens to this world. This is not a place where we are to put down deep roots. We're just passing through this existence. We're not meant for this world. We're meant for another. And so we're different. 
and uh, persecution happens. When people give their life to Jesus and determine that they're going to practice their faith by making disciples. And by the way, what's the use of giving your life to Jesus if you're not going to practice your faith and make disciples and bring people to Jesus? That's really what it's about. It's not just about you. It's not just about you being rescued. It's about you rescuing everyone else around you that you possibly can. And so that's the description of persecution. You're persecuted if you're a believer because you're distinct and your distinction makes you different from the world around you. But I want you to pick up with me in verse 21, and I want you to see the motivation. What is it that's driving persecution uh, specifically? I obviously have already mentioned that, but if you understand what's behind it, when you're persecuted, it'll help you to endure it if you know somewhat of the reasons. I read a book recently called The Insanity of God. It's uh, The author uses a pseudonym because he deals with uh, believers all over the world that live in uh, strict uh, regimes, whether religious or political regimes. And uh, But anyway, he said in, in that book, he, he interviewed over a period of 15 years, he conducted uh, and reported and recorded interviews and analyzed interviews of over 600 persecuted believers from 72 different countries. And he simply concluded this, God uses persecution and sufferings for his purpose. Well, that's true. But can I give you a little bit more information than that? And I would simply say this, going back to the first 17 verses in John 15, the life in the vine, I can say that very clearly the purpose of God allowing persecution to touch the lives of believers is because he wants to increase our spiritual fruitfulness. That's what it's about. Persecution increases spiritual fruitfulness. It's, it's, all, it's almost a, an oxymoron. The more that you kill Christians, the more Christians uh, live. The more that you shed Christian blood, the more that Christianity, real, the real stuff spreads. In fact, in John 15, Jesus says that his father, God the Father, is the vine dresser, calls him the husbandman. And he says that every branch in Jesus that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away every branch that bears fruit, he purges or he prunes it that it may bring forth more fruit. Persecution is one means whereby the father is pruning the branch so that he can increase fruitfulness so that we would bring forth not just fruit, not just much fruit, uh, not just more fruit, but much fruit. And also, I said last week that the Father wants us to be fruitful. Not, not only does he prune to make us fruitful, but also he wants us to minister there is two kinds of fruit for the believer. There is fruit that is really emblematic of your character within you. It's called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. Okay, That's the character within you. That's one type of fruit. But there's also another type of fruit that is uh, actually the ministry of that God does through you, that uh, other people partake of your spiritual fruit, and they are given life and strength. And so that kind of fruit is a fruit that is ministry through you, not just character within you, but ministry through you. And here is one way in which that ministry through you is accomplished, through persecution. The gospel is furthered through persecution. You become fruitful. So look at verse 21 with me. 
as we think about the what's behind this, why does the world hate Jesus and thus hate us because we are his followers? Verse 21 says, all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. When Jesus says they don't know him that sent me, he's talking about his heavenly father. He's talking about the father, God, the father. And so one reason that motivates persecution of the believer by the world is their ignorance. Persecution is the result of the world's hatred for Jesus because they are ignorant. They are blind to the father that sent him. He says that in the opening uh, verses, in the prologue, it's called, of the gospel of John. He says, he came to his own and his own received him not. He came to his own created universe and they didn't know him. They were ignorant. of. They didn't recognize him. Even his own disciples, if you recall. Remember Philip in chapter uh, 14, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that would be sufficient. And Jesus said, uh, was it Thomas or Philip? He said, have I been with you so long, and you're still asking me to show you the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And John says in the first chapter that the, the Son, that one and only unique Son of God, he fully expounds the Father to us. You see Jesus, you see the Father because they are co-equal, God. And so they're ignorant, and this is what's driving it. You, you see the, the locking horns of the Jewish uh, leadership with Jesus over and over in John's gospel, and it's because of their ignorance. They're blind to the fact that he is sent by the Father. They don't believe it. Which leads me to the second motivation. Why do they persecute? Not only they're ignorant, but they're insincere. Look at verses 22 to 24. If I had not come and spoken unto you, they had not sinned. But now their sin's exposed. There's no cloak for their sin. He that hates me hates my father also. You know what? Here's, here's a big point, really. You can't say that you believe in God and reject Jesus. You can't say that, yes, I love God, but I'm not sure about Jesus. He's, you reject Jesus, you reject God, period, because Jesus is God. In fact, in the prophecy of, of Isaiah, he is prophesied, and the name that is given to him is Jesus is the everlasting father. The Messiah is the everlasting father, you see. So their oneness. They're insincere. Let's read on. In uh, verse 24, he said, If I had not done among you, among them, the works which none other man did, they had not sinned. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. They witnessed his marvelous words. They saw his remarkable, miraculous works. And they rejected them. They saw the evidence, but they they were dishonest about their ignorance. They were dishonest about their, uh, their acceptance. They were deliberately ignorant. And so their hatred was really trumped up. That's the motivation behind persecution. Let's wind this up. Look at verse 26 and, 20, uh, and 27. By the way, verse 25 says, uh, you know, what? why this persecution, what it all adds up to? It adds up to the fulfillment of Psalm 35, 19 and Psalm 69, 4, two prophetic uh, verses that says, they hated me without a cause. People hate Jesus for no reason. It is trumped up. The reason they hate Jesus is not real. It's not, uh, it's not accurate. It's a prejudice that they have against him. And there is an insincerity in it all, behind it all, and a deliberate ignorance. In verse uh, 26 and 27, he says, but when the comforter, by the way, we met that word comforter back in chapter 14. 
The first time it appears, Jesus is talking about the comforter, and he, he then defines who it is. The comforter, he says, is going to take my place. I'm going to go away. I'm going back to my father's house. But he says, I'm not going to leave you abandoned as orphan children, unwanted and uncared for and unloved. I'm going to send a replacement. I'm going to send someone just like me in my place. And that is none other than he, the one he calls the comfort. The word translated comforter literally is one called alongside. And he explains that that comforter, that one called alongside, is none other than the Holy Spirit of God. Don't make the mistake into thinking that the Holy Spirit is just an influence or a force or an energy uh, source. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is the he is Christ's substitute on this earth and has been ever since the fulfillment of the day of Shavuot to the day of Pentecost when he descended to indwell believers. He's God's comforter. When the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Remember, it hadn't happened yet. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit after he ascended to heaven, sat on the right hand of the majesty on high, the throne of God, and he sent, as the Father promised, the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 is the record of that. I will send, he says, even the spirit of truth. He calls him the spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he'll testify witness of me, verse 27, and you also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, in these last closing verses is really the solution to persecution. Here's the solution. Jesus is providing for us whatever we need facing the oppression that we will be up against or that we face. And it's very clear that his provision, his solution is a person, right? You see it there. It's none other than the person of the Holy Spirit. He wants to encourage his disciples that in a hostile environment like this world, you are going to be encouraged by me sending the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of Truth in that 26th verse. And the, he's the Spirit of Truth because he reveals the world is just full of lies. You know, sometimes it's hard to sort out, right? Truth from error. But the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth, and he enables you to know what is true and what is false. He's the Spirit of Truth. I'm going to send, he's going to reveal the world's lies, and he's going to strengthen you to bear the truth of my message to this world. He's going to be the needed helper in your persecution. Whenever you suffer persecution, you haven't yet, when you do, you will have the strength of the Holy Spirit, this person, to enable you when you suffer persecution. And that Help will be supernatural help. It really will be miraculous help. You remember what Jesus, uh, or what uh, the writer of Hebrews said about Jesus in Hebrews 12? He said, consider him, Jesus, who suffered such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied in your own mind. For he said, you haven't, uh, you haven't striven with sin. You haven't you haven't shed blood in your striving against sin, is what he says, like Jesus did. So consider him. And the Holy Spirit makes us aware of what Jesus suffered on our behalf. So the solution in persecution is the provision that he gives us of a, of a person, the Holy Spirit. But with that person of the Holy Spirit comes his power. With the person comes the power. The Holy Spirit's power presents God's truth to this world that is against God through us. We haven't gotten there yet. Next week we'll be in chapter 16. In chapter 16, Jesus says, 
I'm going away, but I'm going to send the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. There, the Spirit is going to convict of sin, of not believing on me, of righteousness because I go away and you see me no more. You won't have the, the clear example of what a righteous man looks like. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, which is Satan. In other words, Jesus was going to judge Satan at the cross. And we'll talk more about that in the PM Bible study. But the fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit powerfully presents God's truth to the world. But you know how he does it? You know how he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Through you. Through believers. That's how he accomplishes it. Because the Holy Spirit is not merely in the world. He's in you. And it's your life. It's your life that is distinct and different from this world. That is a conviction to the lost world around you, which makes you, of course, then the target of their persecution. But don't worry. He empowers us as believers. He empowers us to bear bold witness despite the pain. You realize that's what Acts 1.8 is all about? Jesus said before he ascended back to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Spirit to you. And when the Spirit of God has come upon you, you are going to be witnesses unto me. Did you know that the word witnesses in Acts 1.8 is the same word that we get our English word martyrs from? You're going to be martyrs unto me. Sometimes witnessing actually becomes martyrdom. But it is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that enables believers to bear bold witness despite the pain. The first persecution that hit the early church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 4, they come back, uh, Peter and John, and they report to the church. And you know what the church does? They have a prayer meeting. And you're thinking, oh, I bet they prayed, God, stop them from persecuting us. God, judge them from... No, here's what they prayed. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and they said, Lord, thou art God. You made heaven and earth the sea and all that's in them. And by the mouth of your servant David, you said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. And uh, here's what they pray. And Lord, behold their threatenings. Listen to what they're saying. But the next part of their prayer is not, and Lord, stop that. Stop them from threatening us. Stop them from what they want to do to us. Listen to their prayer. Behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word by stretching forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done in the name of Jesus. And when they had prayed, here's what happened. The place where they were was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what I'm talking about. That's the solution to the believer's persecution. That's the provision that Jesus gives us. He gives us the person of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be bold witnesses despite the pain that we're suffering. And here's a a, a good question. Is Jesus worth suffering persecution for? Of course he is. In fact, These same disciples, in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 5, they're beaten. They're beaten for preaching the gospel in the temple. And after they're beaten, it says that they left that place praising God and thanking him that they were counted faithful to be worthy to suffer for his name. They rejoiced. You see... The Holy Spirit enables you to even praise God in the midst of persecution. He's worth being persecuted for. He's worth dying for. 
I think one of the greatest shames in our time of unprecedented suffering and dying for Jesus around this world is that so many of us are in love with the world and we blend in with the world that hates Jesus. That's a shame. As I said, I recently read a book and it was just a, a lot of interviews that this man did around the world of believers that were persecuted. One particular one stands out in my mind. It was a interview that he did in Russia years ago. His name was Dmitri. Dmitri, he grew up in a Christian home, but after years of communism, uh, a lot of the pastors were either killed or imprisoned. Churches were shut down, destroyed. And uh, so Dmitri, his husband, uh, his wife and his children, they had no access to a church. In fact, they got to church probably once or twice a year because the church that they would attend would be about a four mile walk. God put it in his heart to take the family Bible that they had and every day to begin to read that family Bible to his children. He went to tell his wife what he wanted to do, and his wife was elated because he didn't know this, but for several years she had been praying that he would do that. So he, he would open the Bible, read a portion of the Bible, and then as best as he could, he'd explain it to his children. And they'd talk about these Bible stories. Later on, his children asked, can we also maybe sing some of the songs that we hear the time or two that we go to church each year? Can we sing some of those songs as well after we read the Bible and talk about it? So he incorporated singing. Then they began to pray also together as a little family. Well, in this small village, it wasn't long until other people heard what was going on and they came to the house and they wanted to join and just listen in. And so pretty soon, 25 people were coming on, on a, a weekly basis like that to the home. And of course, the authorities came by and they warned him, if you don't, this is a church. And he said, what do you mean it's a church? I'm just having a meeting with my family and these people just happen to want to come. And it's true. They said, it's a church. And you need to stop it immediately or there's going to be repercussions. I kept doing it. Group grew to 50. Then it grew to 75 people. And when it hit 75 people, the authorities realized this can't go on. And one night they, they came in, broke into the meeting. And the, the police officer went up to Dimitri and he grabbed him. And uh, he was dragging him out, and an elderly grandmother stood up bravely. She put her finger in the face of that officer, and she said, You've just laid your hand on the man of God. You will not survive this. It happened on a Tuesday night. On Thursday, that man dropped dead of a heart attack. They took Dimitri to prison, and uh, he was sentenced to 17 years in prison. And during those 17 years, he said there were two things that enabled him to not break down and give in to them wanting him to deny his faith. The first thing he said was, I learned from my dad what he did when I was a child. Every morning he would get up and he would face east and he would raise his hands to heaven and he would sing a hymn of praise to God. And he said, I did that every morning. I mean, in front of 1,500 hardened criminals. And he said, they would curse and they would throw things at me. They would bang their metal cups on the bars. They sometimes would even throw human feces at me. But every morning he did that, sang that hymn of praise to God. He said, a second thing I, I did that my dad taught me, whenever I found just the tiniest piece of paper, 
if I had a piece of, of charcoal or a pencil of any kind, I would, uh, uh, I would take it back to my cell and as quickly as possible, I would write down all the Bible references, all the Bible verses I could fit on that page, all the songs I knew, anything that had to do with the Lord, I'd write it down. And he said, I would take it. And there was a, a pole in the, in the middle of my cell and it always had water running down. It was always damp. And in the wintertime, it was just a sheet of ice. But he said, I'd take that paper, and as high as I could, I'd slap it up there, and it would, it would hang up there. And every time the guards would see it, they'd take me out, and they'd torture me. They'd beat me. And uh, he said, but it was those two things that kept me from breaking and giving in. He said, one day... The guards uh, told me that uh, my wife had been murdered and that my children were wards now of the state. And he said, uh, at that point, I just lost all hope. And they presented me the paper to, uh, to just deny my faith. And he said, bring it in the morning, I'll sign it. He went back to his cell and he said he was just miserable miserable sitting on his his little cot and uh while he was sitting there he said god allowed him miraculously to hear his wife his children and his brother in his home praying for him and he said uh, that clinched it in his mind the next morning they came in with the paper for him to sign he said i'm not signing that you lied to me my wife isn't murdered. My wife is praying for me. My children are praying for me. My brother is praying for me. He went out into that, uh, into the prison yard, and the Lord gifted him with a, a, a full piece of blank paper with a pencil he found out there in the yard. He brought it into his cell, and as quickly, he just filled it both sides, front and back, with everything that he could remember from scripture. So he went and he pasted it up on that, uh, that pole. The guards came in, they saw it, they grabbed him and they were taking him out. They threatened to execute him. They were taking him out to the uh, place where they, where they execute. And on the way out, he said something amazing happened. He said, all of a sudden, 1500 hardened criminals stood to their feet, put their hands over their head, and started singing the song that he sang every morning for 17 years, that hymn of praise to God. He said the guard let go of him and said, who are you? And he said, I'm a man of God. They took him back to his cell, and not too long after that, they released him, and he went back home to his family. And he gave this story then later to this man. That's Dimitri's story. That's the kind of God that we have. He let him suffer for 17 years. But he had such an impact on that prison that every single one of those men knew that God was real. And I don't know how many came to Christ, but I have read in this same book about people in the uh country of China, men that are, that are in prison, that as a result of being in prison, they have started multiple churches in prison. And when those prisoners are released, they go to wherever they're from and other, they start churches. I'm telling you, persecution is not the worst thing that can happen to us. In fact, it can turn perhaps to be the greatest reviving that the church here in America will ever face and will ever experience. But that's his story. What's your story? What about you? And again, I ask you the question, is Jesus worth being persecuted for? Is it worth embracing him? Is he worth dying for? These are heavy questions. I understand that. But these are questions that deserve to be answered and must be answered by every single one of us. And if you're not a believer, you don't have the basis for answering these questions. You need him, first of all, to save your soul. If you're here and you're lost, you don't know Jesus, or you have a doubt whether you're 
his child. We'd love to show you from God's word how you can settle that once and for all, how you can know that you have eternal life because you're not trusting in how good a life you live, but what Jesus did perfectly and fully for you on that cross when he took your sin and punishment in your place as your substitute. So in a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity. In the meantime, our song leader is going to come. We're going to prepare to sing a closing number. And as that happens, if you are saved, I want you to consider seriously this question. Is Jesus worth dying for? And if he is, what are you doing for him now? What are you, are you prepared for a day? You say, ah, oh, that's not going to happen. Mark my words, it's coming. And it may be sooner than what we think. You need to make some serious decisions if you're a believer today, because don't wait until the last minute. Make up your mind now. Who are you going to stand with? Who are you going to be true to? Who are you going to be loyal to, men or Jesus? What are you willing to suffer? Because he's worthy. He suffered for you.